it was just like going from watching match of the day to then like sitting in the dressing room having seen the players like maybe six months ago playing in the Premier League. Like I think that was the biggest shock for me. Um, England internationals, internationals all over the place. Like it was, it was crazy. Like Sandro at the time, obviously the Brazilian Tottenham midfielder was um, playing in reserves. Like it was just nuts. Um, people like Junior Hoyle, Nader Manua, Carl Henry, Stephen Kulka, <laughs> like just all really big sort of household names. And you got me that's been in non-league three years ago and, and sort of been watching these guys from afar. Uh, it definitely, from a cultural perspective, it felt like I, I didn't sit at that moment. Um, but th- that's not to say that the lads were actively trying to exclude me or anything like that. It was just like chalk and cheese in terms of what we'd been through in the last four or five years of our lives, I guess. Is that like an imposter syndrome then, Connor? Yeah, it's definitely something I've, I've, up until obviously the last maybe three or four years ago, it's probably when I managed to shake that off. Um, but yeah, from when I started playing until, I, I'm not I'm not sure if I would have a particular moment in in my head as to, as to where it stopped. I think it maybe just became a little bit less frequent. Um, and then eventually, obviously, you realise 11 years down the line that you're probably not too much of an imposter at, at this stage. Would you have done anything different in terms of that move to QPR? You, you, your words were that it wasn't as successful as you planned out. In hindsight, would you have done anything differently or did you learn a lot of lessons that have made you a better footballer now? I'm just interested in that. Yeah, I don't think I would. Yeah, I don't think I would. I mean, this is what I would love to have gone there and ripped it up. Um, scored in my first game, got off to a great start, things like that. But uh, I also wouldn't be the person I am today and have the life I have today without without that experience. So I, I genuinely do feel like I'm better for it. At the time, it was really tough. It was tough to go through. Uh, four hours with the manager and we, I didn't feel like we saw eye to eye. But now looking back, there were so many things that he taught me about the other side of the game um, and things he'd helped me with tactically and defensively and things like that. So, I, yeah, I don't know how long it took me to score there. To be fair, it was a ridiculous amount of time. Um, as a striker, you want to go in and you want to score early. Um, the standout goal for me was probably it's still the most the most positive thing ever. But I think it was the penultimate game of the season, and we were really struggling. We had a really bad year. Uh, but we weren't far off getting um, dragged into a relegation scrap. And um, we ended up beating Nottingham Forest 2-0 at home and I'd scored the second goal and uh, to keep us in the league, basically. So that was a that was a good moment. And there were, there were good results along the way. Well, we beat Wolves at home. Um, and there had been loads of other sort of memories that, that don't spring to mind right now. But yeah, there was definitely some good memories there, but there was also some really tough games. Um, and like you say, with it being so intimate, it's... Uh, you can hear the cheers, but you can also hear the moans and groans uh, as well. Do you kind of take that into account? Obviously, if you think of QPR being a kind of community club, um, you mentioned kind of fan base and intimate stadium and then success is not really happening on the pitch. Did, does that kind of come into to a player's mindset in terms of trying to support you know, the, the, the club in that sense and trying to do well or... How does that work in terms of the the processes of dealing with maybe bad results and there's fans on your case and there's there's pressures externally? How do you cope with that as a player? I think that you know the match day stuff is is totally understandable. I think um, because you're there, there in the moment. I mean, I just I watch football. I understand how frustrating it is. I do it at the TV now. I can be watching a game that I'm not even necessarily heavily invested in in terms of supporting the team, and I'll see a pass out of play and you naturally go, oh, like, so the match day stuff, I can understand that. The thing that I think affected me the most and that I really don't, I can't condone it at all is just the social media stuff. But I ended up coming off social media for, must have been, must have been, it was definitely for the rest of my time at QPR. Um, it was a good year, 18 months, I think, all social media. Uh, well, no, Twitter and Instagram. Um, because it was just it was just ridiculous like I would so we'd lose on a Saturday or whatever and on a Sunday I'd post a picture of me and my wife going out for dinner and the comments were just ridiculous like um, and I just didn't need that negativity like you know 
you, you load up, you go on Twitter and you see all these notifications. And listen, I'm not saying I sat and read every one, but it's hard not to, when people are actively tagging you in things, saying, oh, shit, shit you are, sorry, uh, language. Um, and things like that was, was just so tough to take, especially for somebody that hadn't come through an academy system and come from non-league, was doing the best that they could sort of thing. It wasn't like I was, I was tossing it off and I was on loads of money. Like, it wasn't. It wasn't that. It was the, it just wasn't happening for whatever reason on the pitch. So, yeah, I found that I found that really difficult. And um, to be fair, it was quite a cathartic experience to come off of come off of there and not feel that pressure every time I looked at my phone and saw a notification after a game. To be honest, 